Hello and welcome to the Mental Health Book Club podcast with your hosts Sydney Timmons and Becky Lawrence. We would like to take this opportunity to let you know that we will be covering a diverse range of mental health topics that may be distressing to some listeners. You can find a full list of the topics being covered in each episode in the show notes. Please check the show notes before listening to any of our episodes. Welcome to the Mental Health Book Club podcast with your hosts, Sydney Timmins and Becky Lawrence. And today we are reading Birth of a New Brain, Healing from Postpartum Bipolar Disorder by Diane Harwood. And the reviews are, Amazon gave this book five stars over three reviews. Goodreads has 4.83 stars, which is from 12 ratings and seven reviews. Sydney gave this five stars and so did I. I really enjoyed this book. And it's probably one of the most recent ones that we've actually agreed on something. Yeah. So that's quite interesting. <laughs> so yeah, Diane is actually our second patron to the podcast. So we'd say like to you. give a big yeah, a big shout out to say thank you so much for being a patron. She's also very active on Twitter with us. She comments and supports us in a really, really thoughtful way. So thank you so much for your support. And I'm hoping to get Diane on the show just after we publish this particular podcast. Let's get on to the book description. So, when a new mother becomes manic overnight from a rare form of bipolar disorder, she stops at nothing to find the mental stability she needs to stay alive. After the birth of her baby triggers a manic maelstrom, Diane Harwood struggles to survive the bewildering highs and crippling lows of her brain's turmoil. Birth of a New Brain vividly depicts her postpartum bipolar disorder, an unusual type of bipolar disorder and postpartum mood and anxiety disorder. During her childhood, Harwood grew up close to her father, a brilliant violinist in the Los Angeles Philharmonic, who had bipolar disorder. She learned how bipolar disorder could ravage a family, but she never suspected that she'd become mentally ill until her baby was born. Harwood wondered if mental health would always be out of her reach. From medications to electroconvulsive therapy, from redwood forest baths to bibliotherapy, she explored both traditional and unconventional methods of recovery in between harrowing psychiatric hospitalizations. Harwood reveals how she ultimately achieved a stable mood. She discovered that despite having a chronic mood disorder, a new, richer life is possible. Birth of a New Brain is a chronicle of one mother's perseverance, offering hope and grounded advice for those battling mental illness. As always, there is so much to discuss in this particular book. As we said, we really both enjoyed it. We do feel a lot of empathy for Diane. I mean, her story at times is completely heartbreaking, particularly when we get on to the parts where she finds that she is medication resistant for her bipolar depression. Yeah, I think that adds to how much you feel for her for every time she tries these medications to try and get some help and and they fail. And you have the side effects as well to deal with. So not only is the medication failing, you've got this fact that you're having all these side effects that may be offset by the fact it would be doing something to help you but it's just phenomenal just how many different treatments she tries to get anywhere near being able to feel what she would classify as being in control of her bipolar yeah well she says there's about 20 until she Mm. finds the one that actually works for her i also want to give a shout out to her husband craig i think throughout the story i really feel so supportive yeah and it is hard for a whole family when this is going on you know because of the impact it has on wider support Oh, exactly. An everyday activity. I mean, there's points when you can fully understand why someone might want to consider walking away in this situation. Yeah. But he stays with her regardless. He does. Although there is a threat at one point because Diane comes off of her medication. Especially when she actually gets violent towards him. And a lot of people, if you hear there's domestic abuse, they go, right, leave. Mm. You know, my mum brought me up to tell me if there was ever any domestic abuse, you leave. And it's not as simple as that. Well, I've been a perpetrator of domestic violence and... I can certainly say it's not as simple as that. And I am dead set against violence. And even that didn't prompt me to go, hang on, there's something wrong. But we'll get into more detail about that. I think we should come back to Diane and start kind of from the beginning of when she really starts to see her bipolar one manifest. Yeah, so she gives birth to her second child. And it's during that that she has a hypermanic session. Which is lesser than mania, but it is still quite intense. So it's a period of up to four days of a heightened state of arousal. So there are certain symptoms that are associated with hypermania over mania. 
Yeah, so she says she says lack of sleep, hypergraphia, which is where you write all the time, and it literally she's talking about writing when she is on the toilet, when she is trying to breastfeed, she also is writing. She's also writing on any surface she can yeah, get hold like of, like tabletops and yeah. her own body and anything she can get her hands on. And even on. yeah, and even when her hands are hurting from all the writing because it's so manic that actually she carries on because she has this you know she has to get every single thought down she also has this sense of grandiosity that all of these thoughts that are racing through her head are pure genius and she's got to get those down yeah she refers to a film i've not seen called charlie gordon from 1968 where she says that he like gets he gets to be a genius for several days and she feels suddenly she's in like this film and that she's got that same thing so she's got to use this genius for good by writing down everything just in case what i found interesting is that the fact at this point that no one around her really starts to identify that she is in a hypermanic state it's the fact that when you have a baby because this happens after the birth of her second baby of course you're going to be happy you're going to be joyous you're going to be excited it's a new baby i assume this is what happens because (laughs) i've never had a child but people around would assume that you're just being a happy new mum. well even when she's in the delivery suite and she has the epidural and she is laughing hysterically because she's not in pain anymore and they just assume that's just the drugs having an effect it's like it's you know like we're you know you take high doses of painkillers and you can get a bit high and a bit funny so everyone puts it down to either the fact that she's elated because she just had a baby she had the pain medication so she's got drugs in her system and no one really gets down to in those 24 hours that actually this is something serious and this is an episode of some sort and actually when she looks back to her first child's birth she actually thinks that she also had a some of the symptoms back yeah, then as well yeah. she says looking at the photograph she's like grinning like a cheshire cat it's like too much it's not a natural smile it's not a natural pleasantries and it's later on so she's so lucky after that i want this can i just say (laughs) anyone out there if i ever have a child i want a doula yeah just saying a hula doula doula doula. yeah i'd never heard of this and i think they're amazing and if we, if there's any listening uh, people we would love, love to speak yeah, to you and find out about, their experiences yeah because actually her doula goes on to write a book because and includes her as one of the cases because she's she's dealt with so many women that have just had babies and so they have a doula and um, paid for very kindly by another family relative and a doula sounds fantastic so basically she's there to look after the emotional health and the uh, practical help associated with what you would need after having a child yeah and so she is there she looks after the siblings if there are siblings she is there just to provide support she will do the washing up and kind of the things that as a new mum you're going to be so exhausted yeah and make sure that mum eats and sleeps and rests and and gets all the things with breastfeeding if there's any problems there and all of those kind of things like just supports mum and I think it's great for I know she has this for her second child but any probably new mum would find this really useful because those women have got so much experience mm. and there is no book to how to have a child well, and there what is to a, do there are several books well, but they're yeah. all contradictory yeah there's no there's no golden guide to parenting and we don't necessarily also get taught about how to parent successfully I mean let's be honest unless it's math science history etc you're not necessarily like this is a child this is you kind of get the this well, is how you put a nappy on kind of thing well we try but and not the emotional health the side in, of things. we try and discourage the education about what to do in parenting to teenagers because you know yeah because you don't want them to be <laughs> popping out kids yeah but she this doula seems amazing and yep. she's the one that actually starts to worry about and she hasn't Diane. known diane before this so no. it's she's only going on what she's seeing at the time when and she comes into the household after the birth of Mariella. Yeah, and Diane realises that actually um, when she's around, she is calmer. She is able to confide in her in a way she can't confide in her husband and other people. And she is a real help in the whole time. So I, I do think this doula has a really good positive effect in that she starts to say, look, I think there's something wrong and starts to question what's going on. Definitely. I think it's when she's actually diagnosed, I think she really does see it as a sense of failure, Mm. as if, you know, first of all, she links it to it only happens to brilliant people and she's just a mum. And obviously she's she's not not just a mum. And she also, I think, is so scared of what that might do because she might be seen as an unfit mother. Well, yeah, exactly. You've got this 
idea that if they decide that you're an unfit mother, they may take your child away from you. Yeah. Which is in itself extremely scary. And she suffers a lot of guilt because she can't do certain things for her children because of the way she is uh, feeling and doing and, and the fights that she, with her husband that her children sometimes witness and, and the shame of feeling this way and not being able to cope. Yeah, exactly. So if she puts a voice to the things that she's feeling and she is going on in her brain, how are other people going to react? And that again links back to the stigma associated with mental illness in itself and the fact that she is this new mum and she is meant to be able to look after this child and yeah the shame because she's she thinks that she must be this brilliant person that can just do everything just like that yeah and actually even when her baby is underweight when it's being weighed the doctor doesn't really look into what's going on and then it's only again that it goes back and it's still underweight and then she he the doctor actually goes you're You're manic manic. yeah because it's gone from hypermania to mania yeah which is a step up yeah, I mean, hypomania must be really hard to identify at times because there are extremes, but she hid those a lot. Mm-hmm. Like she was doing a lot of the writing at night. She was scared and, and fearful. And yeah, she was hiding her laptop so she could get it out at night and be able to use it and things because she knew her husband didn't want her doing that. And it was a whole sort of cycle of trying to all these lies as well, which means she said when she did ask for help, she rang one of the hotlines for help. But she doesn't talk about all the different symptoms. It's just one of them that she's actually particularly worried about. So six weeks after Mariella is born, and I assume that's how you say her name, I apologise if I'm wrong, is when Diane is actually hospitalised in the Behaviour Health Unit for the first of what will be seven hospitalizations, And that's when she gets her diagnosis of bipolar 1. Yeah, bipolar 1 disorder peripartum which basically means that the onset happened because of the childbirth. But they don't necessarily understand fully the reasons behind that. No, because I was surprised when you told me that that it's one of the highest risk moments with someone who could get bipolar, that it's one of the largest triggers is having a child. Yeah, and that is as a result of something that Diane writes in the book because she does a lot of research. So she turns to books and she turns to research to find out more about the condition. I wonder how many doctors actually know what to look out for for postpartum mood disorders i mean i'm guessing as a result of everything that's been happening recently it's a bit more obvious or a bit more prevalent to be looking out for but i must admit that may be something we should ask the secret psychiatrist about yeah and how many health visitors i wonder are actually, trained specifically the, to look out for yeah this. because they're the ones that usually come and do the checkups and stuff so so some of the symptoms of bipolar that we're going to talk about are it can be elevated mood, it can be irritability, goal-directed energy, talkativeness, pressured speech, racing thoughts, spending spree, hypersexuality, which I'm not sure she would have had straight after having a child, and grandiosity. And episodes where she goes through depression. Actually, when Diane's diagnosed, she says that she finds the diagnosis useful. Oh, definitely. And this kind of falls into the debate because there are, I don't know, there's a lot of people out there that discuss the positives and negatives associated with having a label placed upon someone. It can be a relief. It can be that suddenly you feel as you're not, you know, you're not making it up. You're, you're not alone. You're not a hypochondriac. People. It is actually a thing. And sometimes having a name can give you that reassurance. I know for the fact in the UK, it means that you then have access to a whole range of support and it gives you access to the the things that you need to help you rather than not having a diagnosis and then not getting any of the support that you could benefit from. Yeah, but some people are worried about labels because of the stigma attached and also because once you're labelled, that's all that it is. And you, if you actually had a different thing, it wouldn't necessarily be picked up maybe. But I think that's quite important because of the way that we use language. So we went to a talk where we listened to Natasha Devon talk about the Mental Health Media Charter, which is a way for people to discuss mental illness and mental ill health whilst being responsible at the same time. She also, very interestingly in that talk, talked about the lack of language we have for certain things and how... Oh, particularly emotions. Yeah. How limited we are in being able to express emotions from the English language. Yeah, whereas in other cultures there were words that we don't have a word for, we have to describe in a whole sentence. That was very interesting. It was, it was. So we've talked about sort of what bipolar is and how it happens for her. I think the hardest thing was that it took six weeks to diagnose, partly because her hypermania looked 
like she was just sort of excited at her brother's wedding and at the pamper day just before people just assumed she'd had a bit too much alcohol and she was just excited and happy for her brother exactly so it makes it really difficult and i think that should be something that most people need to understand is that it's not an easy diagnosis because when diane talks about her younger years when she is not a parent she talks about these episodes where she goes through depression and higher mood she is diagnosed with clinical depression rather than bipolar disorder at that point. Yes, because she doesn't necessarily tell them about the hypermanic But because issues she doesn't she's really having, know to. Which is interesting, considering her father has also been diagnosed with bipolar 1. So she is at, at an increased risk because it is a first-line relative yeah. that has the same condition. Yeah, but she doesn't always understand or see all of her father's symptoms and diagnosis. She sees a lot more of the depression side. She doesn't actually necessarily see the hypermania as much. Or she does, but she doesn't necessarily understand it. And we've spoken about this on The Clown and I when we talked about that, that the depression, for most people, people can understand the depression because Mm. they've seen it portrayed more on the TV, in the media, with other people. People are much more open about talking about depression in comparison about talking about mania. People go through mania, you can kind of go, well, I don't really understand, and just how severe it can be. Especially as even some diagnosed people say that actually their mania has been helped helpful at times yeah. in their career has been helpful in their life because they are productive they are uh, and people choose to come off their meds yeah. as a result of trying to cope with their everyday stresses so i've heard recently i think i was listening to a podcast another one that was because there are others out there <laughs> but it's it was talking about the fact that this person came off of their medication for bipolar because they wanted to be able to try and save their business and the way that they were going to save their business was during a stay where they have this well, yeah, heightened to put all sense of, of yeah to put all of yeah. their energy and all of their mental capacity into yeah, one thing exactly and they'll have this elevated mood they'll have this increased energy the and lack, they'll be yeah, and not need for so much sleep and all that kind of exactly. stuff exactly and of course that sounds like fantastic there are days when we sit here going oh I wish there were more hours in the day yeah. and that is a way to achieve more hours in the day because you're not sleeping as much yeah but has huge consequences and knock on effects because you come off that medication and especially when you fall and do the opposite and fall into the depression as well which she does talk about depression a few times when she's a young adult when her grandma dies when 9-11 happens because her dad goes through a large depressive episode so that impacts on her yeah and then when her dad actually dies and Mm. the depression around that as well i think maybe at this point instead of talking about dad i think we should talk about dad a bit later because that is an interesting story in itself i think maybe now we should talk talk about medication in a bit more detail because we have this thing where we see that Diane has this kind of love-hate relationship between trying to take medication to stabilise her mood and the fact that there are so many side effects and also on top of that it turns out that she is medication resistant particularly with her bipolar depression because she tries at least 20 different drugs and none of them work but yet she still gets these horrendous side effects. Yeah things where she talks about she ends up having to have a sleep aid to help her because she can't sleep she talks about when she's got too much lithium in her system and how that effect of her and actually even when she's on amitriptyline she has suicidal tendencies and ends up being hospitalized for it where she's getting idolizations about hanging herself which she you know feels that she wouldn't naturally have had but this medication kind of triggers in her system And as a result of basically needing or wanting to have something that impacts and is helpful for her, she is prescribed a benzodiazepine and that is a tranquilizer. And because it's kind of unclear in the book as to whether the side effects were really explained to Diane at this point, but benzodiazepines are extremely addictive and she finds that she becomes addicted to these tranquilizers. Really quickly as well. And she even admits that she drives while taking them when she shouldn't. Which, unfortunately, benzodiazepines do impact your ability to be able to operate heavy machinery such as cars. Yeah, and she even says that she almost has two accidents with the kids in the car because of the medication. And this does scare her and worry her. So she does end up trying to come off of them. But then she gets a load of side effects or withdrawal symptoms from coming off of her medication. And her anxiety, because she's using the benzodiazepines to treat her anxiety so because she's coming off the benzodiazepines the anxiety spikes and she needs to find a different way to cope with it and then she turns to alcohol yeah now she has 
she does say in the book that she's been alcohol free since 2013 so well Fan- done fantastic Amazing. um but before that she was a daytime drinker alcohols which she didn't actually enjoy she didn't want to drink but she did to dull her brain a bit because that's what the benzos were doing beforehand and you can and she's s- dead set against it yeah though. So maybe we'll bring a bit of dad in now because dad is diagnosed with bipolar one as well. She sees him go through his journey with his own mental health issues. He is an artist. He's a violinist. He plays with an orchestra. And so there are times when he has these periods of mania and there are times when he is extremely depressed. Yeah, she talks about how they her parents argue quite a lot and partly due to the alcohol because he'd come in, drop his violin. Well, not drop, obviously. No, because it's... Uh, very- very very carefully the violin and then pick up the alcohol exactly and so she's seen firsthand the impacts that alcohol has had on her family because of her dad she also talks about the fact that her first crush had an addiction to cocaine and because of that addiction they weren't able to get into a college and so she's got this understanding that these things aren't necessarily great for your overall health but she does it anyway yeah because she's just trying to cope and after Taking trying anything, so exactly. many different medications you can see why and also when they you can see why because of all this frustration that actually when she's taking some medications she starts to look for alternatives she starts to try and find out well is there another way of doing this because nothing the doctor seems to give me seems to work so she looks into fish oils holy basil which apparently has been used in india for a very very long time is meant to help calm you. She also looks into how to have the healthiest of lifestyles to try and find lots of different coping mechanisms. Exactly. So in the past, she's used exercise. So at one point, Diane was a personal trainer and as a result of doing all of that exercise, it helped to relieve her depressive symptoms. Yeah, and keeping a routine. She even, she loves to read. She tries bibliotherapy, which she can't afford. So she teaches herself and so she starts reading uplifting novels, including Anne of Green Gables, which she actually finds out the author had mental health issues and died of suicide. So can s- somehow relate to some of the issues in the books and things. She also does a lot of research, something mm. that we both have done when we found out about different things, hence why we do this as well. Yeah, exactly. It prompted us to start the Mental Health Book Club was because when I was first diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, the first thing I did was go to books to find out more information about how people live with the condition, how people were coping with the condition, what it was all about, what were the symptoms, all of those kind of things. And so you can see why she would naturally go to that because that was one of her coping mechanisms before anyway, was to read, read and read. Yeah. And including A Unquiet Mind by Dr. K. Redfield Jameson, who she went to school with. Or at least went, was at the same school yeah. at some yeah. time. Yeah, exactly. So imagine walking the hallways and then years later realising that you're actually going to be reading that person's book. I think yeah. I would probably fangirl a bit over that personally. One of the, well, I think there's two of her coping mechanisms I absolutely love. One of those is her dogs. We have, oh, uh, well, you have dogs. I do have. I have two yeah ragtag dogs i have two house rabbits and animals are definitely some of the best therapy so we agree with her completely about how good they are and we love the fact that diane also talks a lot about her animals on social media yeah and yeah so we really really love the animals and the other one i like is her forest baths oh yes i love we picked up as a point that we definitely needed to discuss yeah i love the idea of the first of all she says how green and nature are so soothing and have been seen to be a calming mechanism so a really good coping strategy but also there is a particular study on redwood trees and a scent they give out and how if you're walking amongst them for 20 to 30 minutes that scent naturally calms your body yeah i think it's amazing yeah the power of nature they should bottle that (laughs) if only they could i think that would yeah i think that someone would make a fortune if they did yeah so she does come up with quite a lot of different coping mechanisms do you feel sometimes i felt her mechanisms partially sort of were hypermania partially were coping because when you do things like the research and stuff like that she did seem to talk about it as if she got into it very much focused the hyper focus on one particular subject it's a possibility but then i think the most important part of that was the fact that each time she came up with these new ideas unfortunately her doctors dismissed yeah those ideas and i think that's something we should talk about in the next podcast yeah and so the last thing i wanted to talk about which is kind of related in some ways to stigma but not 
really. It's kind of difficult to explain. What I was thinking is that Diane at points during her treatment and trying all these different drugs to try and find the one that works, she does go through several times where she decides to take herself off medication. And I find that particularly interesting because it is one of those things associated with bipolar is that for her it's not necessarily the same but for most people if when you start to feel better you stop taking the medication whereas for diane unfortunately it's the fact that these she side doesn't effects feel any better exactly she's having these severe side effects particularly with the lithium when she ends up having too much lithium in her body and she's shaking and she can't control the shaking and she has to decrease it and or with the benzos when she feels addicted and also the stigma associated with taking drugs generally. I mean, I told my dad, I think it was this week or last week, because I don't think he actually fully understood that I do take an antidepressant because I've had issues with my mood. I don't think he fully appreciates that I suffer with borderline personality disorder. I'm sure I've told him, but I don't think he fully understands it. But he was like, why do you need that for? Well, because I do, because if I didn't take it, I wouldn't be functioning. I mean, I'm taking the depression test that you can get on the NHS and you can go through it and it will tell you whether you are currently depressed. At the moment, I don't necessarily fit the criteria for but being because depressed you're taking the because I'm taking the medication. So I can see at this point, there could be this possibility that I go, you know what? I might as well come off that because I'm feeling good. I'm feeling yeah. okay. But the issue being that as soon as I come off that, I'd probably end up having a depressive episode again but then i guess also in some ways if i did turn around and go you know what i want to come off my medication one i would be scared because it actually is doing something i can understand why dan's like you know what this is doing nothing that i might as well not take it but two the reaction from people around me if i said i wanted to come off my medication and i think that's what diane finds is that when she is she wants to be open she wants to tell them that she wants to come off this medication but she knows deep down that they're not going to support her particularly the doctor who is frustrated by the fact that she's medication resistant yeah and she hides and her it. Her husband, because I think it is hard for people around you, because they I might think... see more of the effect. But also, they they're the ones that maybe have to pick up things when these it episodes, falls apart. yeah. Again. And so they're worried about that, and they're worried about the impact, you know. And Craig definitely is worried. That's why he actually gives her an ultimatum of you, you know, you take your medication or I call the police. And mm. but you can also see her frustration that actually she wants to be her. Mm. And I do think there's a link between an understanding of we are not our medications Mm. but at the same time they help us to be who we are so there is a blurred line there and I often find it with teenagers that take medications for things like ADHD and stuff like that and they find it very difficult to understand you know who they are anyway because they're teenagers and we all struggle with that really but teenagers especially because they're still finding out And so they often stop taking their medication because they want to know who they are without it. Mm. And it's it's almost a discovery. Well, I definitely don't want to go back to the person I was without medication. But then I guess on top of that, I've also had lots of talk therapy. Yeah, you wouldn't be the same person because you are not the same person that was there before because you've developed and changed and had a lot of, like you said, talk therapy. Yeah, but I do also, I am concerned that how Lawrence would process that if I said I wanted to come off medication. Because what happens if I did relapse? What happens if there was something that happened? I can fully understand why Craig would be in this position. And I'm guessing in some ways Lawrence may have made the same ultimatum if he'd realised I'd come off my medication Mm. and said, you have to be back on that. Especially as often Diane doesn't realise she's in a state of mania I think that's probably the most difficult part is that with bipolar, you're not identifying or you're not able to identify when you are in those periods because at times you're just like this is this is great i mean I the grandiosity symptoms. part yeah. of it means that you feel you're being really successful when i would actually, be really quite happy i think that's yeah. my problem I was, and i think that's probably the problem with most people who suffer with bipolar is that actually this is quite a good state yes mm. people around me may be looking at me oddly and judging me and not understanding what's going on but for me at that point it's probably quite a good place to be until you come back and realise. And with the hindsight, like Diane says, she looks back and she can see when she was having periods of hypermania and mania. That must be really difficult. 
So we're going to leave it there for today. On Wednesday, we will release the next part of this podcast and we'll talk a bit more about the hospitalizations that Diane goes through, the medication resistance. I think that's a big part of Diane's story and the fact that she is, eventually she finds some medication that works, but the fact that you are there trying desperately hoping that she finds something to work. Also a bit more about her father, particularly about how he dealt with his mental health issues while she was growing up, because I think that also impacts some of the feelings that Diane has about guilt and shame associated with her bipolar disorder. So until next time, it's okay not to be okay. And if you're not okay, talk. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Mental Health Book Club podcast. If you need additional help with your mental health, please contact the Samaritans on 116-123, which is a 24-hour helpline. And if you need additional information about mental health issues, please visit MIND at mind.org.uk. Our next book will be A Tiny Piece of Something Greater by Jude Sierra. And our next episode with Secret Psychiatrist will be looking at postpartum mood disorders. If you'd like to find out more about the MHBC podcast, please visit our website, mentalhealthbookclub.com. We really hope that you enjoy this podcast and we would like to hear what you think. Please head over to Twitter, follow us at MHBC underscore podcast, or head over to Facebook and follow our Facebook page, which is Mental Health Book Club. If you would like to show your support further, please share us with your family and friends and leave us a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. 